Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this EMPA webinar. I'm Michelle Poole. I'm a member of the EMPA Board of Directors, and I'm coming to you from Dunedin in New Zealand. Uh, I know we have participants from uh, all around Australia and several parts of New Zealand as well. So welcome, whether it's this morning or this afternoon for you. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. We are all somewhere, so this is different for all of us, but there are traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Today we're going to have the presentation from Professor Jim McLennan, followed by a question and answer session, which uh, really relies on your participation to make this fly. So we're going to hear from Jim and then uh, we will address your questions. So the way this works is that at the bottom of your screen, you will see a little button that says Q&A. And if you click on that, you will be able to type in your questions. And at the end of the session, um, I will start going through those and uh, read them out on your behalf to Professor McLennan, who will answer them. And maybe we have a bit of back and forth about that. You'll also see the traditional chat button uh, down the bottom. If you click on that, you'll open a panel where you can type questions and comments either to other attendees or to um, the presenter. Um, I caution you to just be careful who you're, um, who you're planning to comment to. Um, if, if you're not intending to go to all, um, just be careful that you haven't selected that option. So enough from me. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Jim McLennan from La Trobe University. Jim is an adjunct professor in the School of Psychology and Public Health at La Trobe in Melbourne. He has a long career of researching emergency incident management, firefighter safety, hazard risk and community bushfire safety. Beginning with the 2009 Victoria Black Saturdays bushfires, he has conducted field interviews with survivors after major bushfires in most states and conducted surveys of households in several high bushfire risk communities. He's going to talk to us about householder decision making under the stress of bushfire threat. Jim, over to you. Thank you for, thank you for uh, the, uh, the welcome and introduction, uh, Michelle. Uh, two things uh, to start. Um, Barbara Ryan will send to you all a copy uh, of the slides, uh, so uh, there's no need to uh, feel uh, compelled to uh, make notes on them, uh, although you're free to do so. Uh, secondly, uh, what I cover will almost certainly uh, not be new for many of you. Um, I'm sure it may seem uh, rather an exercise in stating the bleeding obvious, but uh, on occasions I think it's uh, fruitful to um, take stock and uh, check the blood, flow of blood maybe, and uh, also uh, the uh, obviousness. So let's go to the first slide. Okay. No, what's that? the slide uh, uh, be presented. Uh, all I'm seeing is a webinar series. Thank you for attending the slide. So I'm just seeing we have this. Ah, here we go. Okay, right. Okay. Um, well, um, uh, evidence presented, so we've got their evidence presented to the uh, 2009 Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission is uh, certainly consistent uh, in their report with fatal choices having been made under extreme stress uh, and uh, to the extent that was uh, clearly associated with up to 22 fatalities of the 172 civilians who uh, perished uh, as a result of those fires. Uh, and uh, those 22 fatalities comprised uh, uh, 18 adults and uh, uh, four children and uh, they uh, took place in, uh, in, in eight separate incidents. Being threatened by a bushfire forces people to make choices. Um, choices are uh, sometimes a matter of life and death. Um, there's often little time to think things through and the decisions mostly uh, may not be able to be reversed. And all this uh, happens in an environment of embers, smoke, noise and heat. Let's go to the next slide.
I'm uh, often disappointed that um, householders in at-risk areas are not educated sufficiently about the actual nature uh, of the dangers that a bushfire poses uh, to their life. I'm also sometimes surprised to find that uh, some emergency services personnel are not uh, all that aware uh, of what actually kills uh, civilians uh, during or following a bushfire. So I put up this, uh, this table, um, evidence uh, from uh, post-fire investigations, coroner's invest uh, reports and those kinds of things, not only in Australia but also in North America, uh, present a fairly uh, consistent, um, though um, bleak picture. The majority of civilian deaths uh, result from um, convective heat, um, uh, destroying uh, 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 respiratory tissue. Um, uh, uh, about close to that, Okay. Okay, this uh, the lines come up. Uh, uh, oh. Can something be done to uh, display this? Okay. All right. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll 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 continue. Um, uh, the other major cause of death is actually hyperthermia. Um, that is, uh, a person's core temperature rises uh, above uh, forty degrees centigrade. Um, the medical literature suggests that once one's core body temperature exceeds about 43 degrees, then death is probably uh, inevitable um, from multiple organ failure. Uh, yeah. And uh, um, also uh, a significant number of deaths result from um, some subsequent uh, uh, complications following uh, burns. Um, Another fairly common cause of, uh, uh, of death uh, is carbon monoxide poisoning. This is particularly the case where people stay inside uh, a structure uh, which is uh, on fire. Uh, a problem with carbon monoxide is that uh, there are no obvious symptoms. And uh, once one's uh, haemoglobin has been replaced by uh, carboxyhemoglobin uh, to a level of about 50%, uh, then uh, again, death is inevitable. Um, also, some uh, fatalities result from irritants uh, subsequently, and uh, we're familiar with uh, trauma-related deaths, which come from uh, collisions uh, often uh, in, 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 uh, as a result of smoke. Uh, yeah. Next slide. Of course, um, uh, people do survive. Uh, uh, often under the most extreme circumstances uh, in, uh, of a bushfire. And um, uh, of the 483 survivors that uh, uh, were interviewed following the 2009 Black Saturday fires by the uh, Bushfire CRC uh, Research Task Force, um, uh, we found on analysing uh, the, the transcripts that 47 survived what uh, have, would have to be regarded as severe to extreme levels of threat to life. And the key to them doing so was essentially, um, in ordinary language, they kept their heads. Um, what that meant was that they downregulated or controlled or managed um, fear, anxiety, uh, and uh, instead of uh, focusing on their peril, as it were, they focused on the immediate threats to, to life uh, while maintaining an active search for opportunities uh, to survive. Um, However, uh, having said that, uh, for some folk uh, under bushfire threat, um, it's hard to make any kind of uh, decisions, uh, even when life is at stake. Next slide. All right, this uh, uh, is an extract from a transcript uh, of a uh, woman uh, who, who my team interviewed following the 2011 Lake Clifton fire. Um, the woman reported that uh, ringing my husband at work and I was just in a mad panic. I just said to him, I was trying to say what I had to say and I could hardly speak. I'm just saying, tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. Tell me. You can't think. There's a bushfire close, I said. It's coming and just getting closer and closer. He said, grab the dog and get out now. Um, we, did, we found that in a lot of interviews that there's just a kind of a paralysis of thinking, um, inability to make a decision, inability you know, to take a life-saving action. Next slide. 
And sometimes um, a decision is made and um, uh, in hindsight, uh, it wasn't the best decision. This was uh, from a survivor interviewed um, uh, following uh, one of the Black Saturday fires uh, in Bendigo. Uh, he reports, well, things were exploding. It was a war zone. The house was obviously going up. I dragged the kids out in the yard. The kids had bare feet. There's a dry dam up the back and we laid down there. No, we didn't have anything to cover us. It's no time. We all caught burns from embers and stuff. The SES got us to hospital. The kids had to be put on oxygen. When we got back, the house was okay. Just a few burns on the roof. Next slide. Well, uh, we could add uh, uh, the preceding a few examples to lots and lots of others, uh, other accounts of um, survivors' experiences during a range of disaster situations, including bushfires. And it's clear that um, stress uh, can play a significant role in survival versus non-survival. And the question is uh, how, exactly how uh, does stress uh, impact uh, on our survival related decisions? We'll have a, a look at this, um, but uh, it's not easy for uh, researchers like myself and my colleagues uh, to, uh, to study decision-making the residents threatened by a bushfire. So let's have a look at uh, uh, the, the next slide. Uh, the dream uh, for us bushfire researchers. Uh, okay, so uh, what we would love to see is uh, a report uh, in the Journal of Unobtainable Wildfire Research uh, about controlled experimental laboratory investigations of the effects of stress on bushfire survival related decision making by civilians. And sadly, that still hasn't been published. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, a starting point for looking at how stress can impact uh, on survival related decisions is to uh, acknowledge that in some respects at least uh, we are um, baboons uh, who uh, wear clothes uh, and uh, can speak. Uh, what I'm getting at here is that uh, we have a lot of hard wiring in our brains based on our evolutionary heritage and the hard wiring means we process information about us and the world in particular ways and the processes which evolved uh, to keep our hominids uh, from becoming a leopard's breakfast uh, in Africa um, don't always serve us well in our modern world especially the processes involved in strong emotions like fear and anxiety now this can overwhelm uh, our rational problem solving abilities next slide Now, I appreciate this is a busy, uh, I've got a busy slide, um, but uh, uh, you'll, you'll get a, a, a copy of the slides and you can look at it at your leisure. But here's a summary of what are generally agreed upon to human uh, strengths and weaknesses. And among the weaknesses, uh, we have a limited uh, working memory. That is, we can't keep thing, very many things in mind at the one time. Uh, and our retrieval of information uh, can often be patchy. With our thinking, uh, we're limited in the speed with which we think, and as, because of that, we often take shortcuts, uh, rules of thumb or heuristics or best guesses. And um, in ordinary everyday life, uh, these work pretty well, but they may not, like a bushfire. Uh, in terms of, well, we're very social animals, uh, and uh, um, our social interactions don't always go well. Um, we're characterised by groupthink, where a bunch of us uh, together uh, may uh, make a, a wrong decision because we don't want to uh, rock the boat, so to speak. Um, we exclude people in groups and out groups, um, and uh, we're all too familiar with interpersonal conflict and uh, interpersonal conflicts uh, can be exacerbated, made worse, when the stakes are high. Uh, it's interesting, uh, uh, I read about, uh, about baboons and found that uh, when uh, rival troops of baboons encounter each other over disputed territory, um, uh, they throw feces at each other. And uh, I've been in some, some uh, meetings with uh, various conflicting uh, parties and I think I could say honestly that about the only thing that wasn't thrown at the others uh, was was feces. Anyway, um, uh, uh, coming down to the bottom of the, uh, of the weaknesses column, 
uh, strong emotions can override and cloud and distort uh, or bias information. And that's certainly a, a major uh, uh, difficulty um, that we experience in uh, high stress situations. Next slide. Okay, um, before taking a look at the research uh, that's relevant to bushfire survival decision making, just a couple of uh, definitions. Um, uh, the terms stress and stressor are, are often thrown about in everyday conversation, but in the research context, we distinguish between a stressor, uh, that's the, the source of stress, uh, in our case, uh, a threat to life, and stress, and that's the psychological uh, impact of the threat situation. Um, we do need to distinguish between uh, stress as a, a negative mood state from arousal, uh, which is energization uh, or, or activation. Now, and now we'll look at a very widely used model for the stress process, so next slide. Okay, this is the so-called transactional model uh, of uh, the stress process. Um, uh, it's been used in, in many uh, contexts and it's found to be fairly, fairly useful. The notion is that uh, when we experience a threat, uh, a stressor, there's three processes or appraisals. Um, we perceive the threat, we, uh, we from typically from memory or previous experience uh, or problem solving, we ascertain the likely actions we have to take. And then we appraise whether we're going to be able to cope with the actions demanded. And if there's the experience of inability or doubt about that, uh, then uh, we experience stress. Now, under conditions of uncertainty about what's happening with a bushfire, then when a resident believes his or her situation probably involves high threat, serious stuff required of him or her uh, in order to survive, and good reasons to fear the outcome, then high levels of stress are likely uh, to be experienced. Of course, individuals do differ uh, uh, in how they, um, how they react to particular uh, situations. Next, next slide. Now, a great deal of research has been conducted on um, the impact of stress uh, on human skills and abilities, and it's generally so able to be sorted into, uh, four, into four areas. Stress has negative effects, first of all, on perceptual motor skills performance. It has serious uh, effects on attention control, what we focus on can impair quite significantly memory and remembering, and it has uh, serious negative impacts on reasoning, judgment, and decision-making. Um, these, uh, these findings come from a range of, uh, of situations in which uh, people were exposed to uh, stressors uh, and uh, um, typically compared with people who were not exposed to the, the same stress source and the uh, uh, decrement uh, or decrease or degrading of performance uh, by the stressed group uh, is then uh, noted. I'll describe a couple of, uh, of, the, of the situation or the, the studies later on. Next slide. Okay. Um, Looking at then first at perceptual motor skills performance for five studies and overall um, skill level on the, on the tests was decreased by almost a third, 29%. Um, the actual nature of uh, the, uh, the decrease in abilities included um, emerging threats just simply being overlooked, not, not being noticed at all. Um, tasks uh, take longer and the more complex the task was, uh, the longer it took. Um, mistakes uh, were made and I guess the overall um, feature of this is clumsiness. Um, now if we go to the next slide, there's an example. 
Okay, this is from uh, a person interviewed again after the Black Saturday fires. I suddenly noticed that the ash was starting to drop around. So I came over here to get my car and backed out and swung around here to hook up the fire trailer. I looked up as I backed the trailer and I noticed a line of flame at the back of the paddock shit. So I started to try and hook the trailer onto the car and I was having big trouble trying to get it in. I just couldn't seem to get it lined up to lock. I had to give up on the trailer and just leave. Next slide. Another major negative effect of stress uh, is on attention control. That is what we're focusing on. Um, number of studies there. Uh, this time, uh, the, the, the decrease uh, in, in skill uh, was even greater, almost 40%. Um, three, two things rather, uh, became uh, uh, very clear. Uh, mental attention can become narrowly focused on only a few obvious aspects of the threatening situation, uh, and the person misses the really uh, serious uh, uh, threats to life. Also, it's very difficult to, to concentrate uh, on the task at hand, uh, in particular, negative, uh, distracting, um, unhelpful thoughts keep getting in the way. If we go to the next slide, there's uh, an example. This is somebody uh, that uh, we interviewed again following uh, the Lake Clifton fire. So it was like, what do I do, mum? Yes, it was one of those things like, no, I'm thinking it's going to be bad. And I thought, because I'm here on my own, I've got to take charge. But I felt that I wanted someone to say, Angela, just do that. Do you know what I mean? Again, this is a very common experience uh, described by people we interviewed. It's really hard uh, to focus uh, on, on, on the issue uh, and, and look for the actions uh, that are required. Next slide. Memory. Uh, remembering um, is uh, very, uh, very seriously affected um, by, uh, by severe stress. In the four studies uh, in, involved, uh, again, there was uh, the, the, the ability uh, in, in memory tasks was reduced by a third. Uh, yes, okay. I'll just give you a, a, a quick idea of the kinds of research uh, that uh, involve these. <laughs> we wouldn't be allowed to, uh, to, to, to undertake uh, uh, these kinds of research studies uh, uh, now. Um, uh, ethics committees, that just wouldn't wear it. Okay, um, this one called the Ditching Study. Uh, this involved US Army recruits. There were two groups, uh, control, uh, who uh, were not stressed, and the experimental group who, uh, who, who were stressed. Um, the study involved uh, groups of uh, 10 US Army young, uh, recruits um, uh, going for a flight in a, an old, well, the studies were done in 1960, an old DC-3 twin-engined uh, passenger uh, aircraft. Um, the cover for the whole thing was uh, uh, to uh, look at the effect of altitude uh, on doing sort of some psychological uh, abilities uh, tests for the control group. Um, they boarded the aircraft, they were given um, a, a standard uh, safety briefing, a card, uh, including uh, things to do uh, if the aircraft were forced to ditch. Um, they were given, uh, I think, five minutes, uh, ten minutes rather, uh, to read this. Then uh, off they took, uh, did the test, returned, and uh, once the aircraft was back on the, uh, the tarmac, um, they uh, completed a, a, a test of how much they had remembered uh, about the safety briefing uh, document and was scored for accuracy. Experimental group uh, went off uh, in their flight and um, uh, 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 some uh, period into the, into the flight, the aircraft lurched violently. Uh, one of the engines was shut down. Um, the pilot uh, announced that uh, they were unable to land because of a problem with the undercarriage and they were going to have to ditch in the uh, nearby ocean. And the uh, uh, soldiers were informed uh, that they now had to uh, complete the test of uh, remembering uh, uh, the content of the briefing uh, card because this would probably help them to survive uh, the, the ditching. Uh, not surprisingly, um, the, uh, uh, the amount uh, remembered 
by the uh, stressed group who were facing ditching uh, was appreciably poorer uh, than the uh, scores uh, by the control group, notwithstanding the fact that uh, the, uh, they were, had been told uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, accurately recalling the material would help them to survive. So that's, that's, a, that's a sampler, if you like, of, 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 of what some of the studies are in, uh, involved. Um, but uh, the actual effects then, the more generally, uh, it's very difficult to keep important things in mind uh, that you have to do. And it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to retrieve from memory survival-related information, uh, like in our bushfire situation, uh, the driving directions uh, to actually get to, 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 to safety. Uh, one of the folk I interviewed uh, following Black Saturday um, uh, habitually uh, uh, turned, uh, uh, turned uh, 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 left uh, at a particular intersection. Um, they knew, uh, were aware of the, that uh, the fire uh, was approaching from that direction, um, but uh, just turned left automatically because that was the, what, what was easier to retrieve uh, from memory, uh, more difficult. Uh, to retrieve the directions uh, uh, that they would have to take with a right turn uh, to uh, go to safety. Next slide. Here's an example, again, like following the Lake Clifton fire. Uh, in the interviewer, did you put the sprinkler systems on? Interviewee, no, I didn't actually. I was on the mobile phone all the time. I got to the car, dropped the phone in the car, and I just went. Later, I thought, shit, I didn't do that and we lost the house. Next slide. And reasoning, judgment and decision making, uh, particularly complex decision making uh, is uh, very much uh, interfered with uh, by, uh, by stress. Um, just quickly, uh, another, another study by type, yes, um, the so-called artillery shoot uh, study. Again, um, same group of researchers in the United States with uh, US Army uh, recruits. Um, uh, the scenario essentially was the recruit uh, was uh, out in the field as a spotter during a live artillery shoot. Uh, and was communicating uh, using a, a radio um, uh, at a particular point in time. Um, uh, the instructions came over the radio uh, that they had to reset uh, the frequency uh, and there was uh, instructions on how to do that um, uh, uh, as part of the radio equipment. Um, the instructions were quite complex and a number of decisions had to uh, be made uh, in order to uh, successfully uh, uh, get the, uh, the radio reset. Now, in the um, control condition, um, the uh, uh, soldier was simply instructed over the radio uh, to make the change. Um, uh, the, the, his performance was, uh, was recorded uh, both for time and for the number of errors uh, 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 which he made. In the control, that was the controlled condition. In the experimental condition, um, uh, it was the same kind of setup, except at a particular point, uh, a loud explosion was set off um, uh, nearby, um, uh, you know, showering um, you know, dirt and things like that around. Uh, and uh, the instructions to the soldier were to this were again to reset the radio, but this time. Uh, the information was it was important to do this uh, urgently uh, because a soldier uh, had been injured uh, and he, uh, the uh, soldier with the radio, uh, was going to have to uh, relay information uh, so that uh, medical, the medical teams uh, could arrive. Not surprisingly, uh, the soldiers in the, uh, in the high pressure situation took much longer uh, and made, made more errors, uh, more wrong judgments uh, uh, compared with the, the controls. Um, next slide. Okay, uh, this is again somebody we interviewed after the Black Saturday fires. Um, um, do you know what I did? Like, the embers were hitting me quite forcefully because the wind was so high. And I was completely exposed, standing on the wind, so windward side of the house with the hose. I just stood there and I thought, shit, all of a sudden, you know, the heat of the fire, I couldn't breathe and smoke was everywhere. I put the hose over my head because it was so hot and ducked around the back. 
But anyway, I thought, God, that was really dumb. Next slide. Okay, that's a coverage of the kinds of research uh, that's been conducted over the years uh, to, to, to study uh, the actual uh, effects of, uh, of, of high stress uh, on important aspects uh, of our thinking um, there. What are the implications? Well, again, I guess there's a, not a lot that, that will be new. It's important to raise awareness. And I think perhaps what we fail to do uh, in our education of uh, householders and residents is to, to inform them about the actual nature of the threats to life that um, uh, bushfires pose, um, and also um, the need to uh, make clear that, that they are likely to experience uh, a lot of anxiety, uh, high stress, uh, and that this has to uh, be expected and taken into account. Um, it really is important uh, for people uh, to, before the onset of the threat, uh, have a plan. It's extraordinarily difficult uh, under high stress uh, to come up um, uh, cold, as it were, uh, with a response um, that hasn't been sort of thought about before. So a plan really is important. Um, practice and rehearsal uh, certainly uh, is valuable, although it's extremely difficult, uh, my experience has been extremely difficult to actually get people uh, to, to make the time, take the time, make the effort uh, for a rehearsal. However, even just a, a, a conversation uh, about um, uh, what a household would do in the event of a bushfire threat is a lot better than nothing. It's an interesting statistic on the importance of, uh, of, of rehearsals. Um, a major Canadian study some time ago looked at uh, fatalities uh, associated with, uh, with, yeah, with helicopter crashes over water uh, ditchings. And what was found was that um, uh, across um, ten, about 10 years worth of uh, the helicopter ditching uh, uh, events investigations, um, the survival rate for uh, passengers uh, who had not actually undertaken uh, a practice ditching uh, was about 60%. For those who had uh, actually uh, undertaken uh, a, a practice uh, of escape from a ditched helicopter, the survival rate was 90%. Uh, I've always thought about that as being a pretty stark uh, indicator of the, the value of, of rehearsal practice. Um, one thing that's that, uh, some of my colleagues have found to be useful uh, is the notion of a pre-mortem game. Um, uh, it is asking uh, having householders uh, as a group um, to talk about their plan uh, and then come up with different ways in which it might go wrong. Um, uh, and uh, certainly in, in the, uh, the, the, the world of safety, um, industrial safety, this notion of pre-mortems uh, has become uh, uh, quite important. Um, all coming down to the notion that um, uh, people in uh, uh, residing in bushfire risk areas uh, really do need to uh, to, to, to prepare uh, and um, considerable effort needs and creativity needs to be um, and devoted to that because preparation is uh, what we want, not last meditation. Next slide. In terms of incident management, um, it's uh, really important to just keep the stressed civilian uh, in mind. Um, um, fact, the stressed civilian uh, into planning and training exercises and then maintain a stressed civilian focus, especially in relation to evacuations. Um, uh, the um, uh, capacity for uh, people to make the wrong decision uh, should always be, uh, be borne in mind. Next slide. And finally, in terms of uh, warnings, um, uh, this is certainly not new, I know, but uh, it's important to, I think, to always bear it in mind. The importance of timeliness and uh, being very aware of this latency factor. Uh, people do not 
uh, immediately uh, begin to leave uh, when they're, they're uh, left with a, a, a warning. Um, I've interviewed a, a number of people um, uh, who uh, were, were sort of overtaken uh, by events. Uh, it took them so long uh, to get, get themselves actually organised um, that um, by the time they were ready to leave, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't possible. Um, the uh, escape routes had been uh, cut off and they found themselves in a situation of having to um, uh, you know, defend uh, an, uh, an inadequately prepared uh, uh, house. Um, and uh, uh, it was a near run thing uh, for them. Um, again, messages have to be short, um, uh, very clear and without ambiguity uh, because uh, of the effects uh, of stress that I've already mentioned uh, on our thinking, particularly our ability to, uh, to focus, uh, uh, to, to attend uh, and uh, uh, to keep things in mind. And I think we go to the final slide. Yeah, so there we go. Um, if there are questions or comments, I'll do my best to respond and I can always be contacted by email uh, uh, at, uh, uh, at Latrobe uh, uh, with the address there. So if there are uh, questions or comments, um, uh, um, uh, Michelle, I'm sure we will uh, we'll organise those and I'll do my best to um, respond. And I'll have a sip of water in the meantime. Sorry, I started talking and I realised I was on mute. Um, well, it was just me who did that. So. <laughs> Even through all the COVID experience, we're, we're still doing that. So look, I can see there are a couple of questions that have started to come in. What I'd like to do is give people an opportunity yeah. to just process what they've heard and um, and start putting their questions through. So I have one that I'm just going to give to, to kick off. Sure. Um, particularly interested in, in the uh, helicopter rehearsal uh, findings that um, the people who'd practiced a ditching uh, actually did better than, than those who, who hadn't. And thinking about what you said in the context of, you know, the safety briefings and things that we all hear from airlines and, and everything else, is, is there any research that says how often people have to hear a reiterated message and, and you know, bring it, bring it out of the airline context into the... Um, you know, into the emergency uh, sphere, how many times do people have to hear a message repeated until it will stay with them when they're under stress? Okay, let's try to, uh, take the, uh, the first one. Um, with the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, helicopter ditchings, the, the, the practice uh, is, uh, the standard practice is very real. Essentially, it's uh, a helicopter hull um, which uh, 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 is, is dumped with the passengers uh, uh, into a big swimming pool. Um, so it, it, it's not a uh, uh, it's not uh, being shown a video or uh, anything like that. It, they 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 actually they're told what to do. They're instructed and trained. Uh, then they're strapped into a helicopter using in the clothes that they would normally wear. The, uh, the the helicopter hull is then you know, dropped into the water at about the uh, the speed um, that uh, an auto rotation the helicopter hits the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the water tipped over um, and uh, they have to get out now it's done with great uh, with, with considerable precautions of people around and medical help but it, it is the real deal uh, as it were um, uh, I, I think it, it's a for me, it's a classic uh, example of the difference between knowing about and knowing how to. Um, a lot of our, of, our, of, our, of our training really is at the level of teaching people about uh, something. Um, and uh, that's you know, generally far inferior uh, to teaching them how to, as it were. The second one uh, on, um, uh, uh, on aircraft uh, safety briefings, um, the limited amount of research that has been done um, indicates that uh, people who who read who actually read the briefing um, you know, mindfully before the accident event 
do much better, that is, they're more likely to survive, than people who, who don't read it uh, on that trip. <laughs> Uh, that uh, they're experienced travellers, they've heard it all before, uh, and um, uh, they, in psychological jargon, they're not primed uh, to access the information for this trip, as it were. Um, uh, again, the limited e evidence uh, indicates that um, a major factor in survival or non-survival, uh, particularly in, in a landing or takeoff incident, uh, is the um, is, is the skill uh, of the air crew, uh, also of the cabin crew, who actually uh, the the more they take control, as it were, and in fact not rely uh, on uh, passengers' you know, knowledge of what to do, um, the greater uh, the uh, the likelihood of survival. Um, uh, for example, um, some of the uh, British research indicated that a major factor uh, in getting people out of an aircraft uh, which has had a landing or a takeoff accident, now they, they've survived to that point, uh, but the aircraft is probably on fire, uh, is uh, the, the usefulness of yelling at people to actually to get out. To, 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 the important thing is to overcome um, what I kind of alluded to a couple of times, this inertia. Uh, in the high stress situation. Thank you. So the best I can manage. No, good. So look, now we've got quite a few questions that have come through. So uh, the first one is from Caroline Alcorso and she says, how long do stress reactions last and affect how people make decisions in the weeks and months to come? Right. It's very much an individual, an, an individual um, uh, situation. One of the things um, that, that's, that one of the very few things that, that, that's absolutely clear uh, is a person is more likely to uh, have a, a, a significant uh, enduring reaction. Uh, the, the, the greater was their, their threat to life. Uh, yeah, that, that's a general, general uh, relationship. Um, beyond that, um, we really don't know a great deal uh, about uh, vulnerability. Um, uh, to post-traumatic stress uh, 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 disorder. Um, we can say that uh, people who um, have been experiencing mental health, health issues are more vulnerable, um, but beyond that, um, uh, it, it, it's still an ongoing uh, area. Um, there's fa fairly well uh, uh, established uh, research supporting the notion that, um, oh, not the notion, that's silly, uh, the principle that, um, that uh, psychological first aid quickly uh, is very beneficial. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, anything very dramatic, just the opportunity to allow the person to talk about uh, their experiences um, and uh, to um, then sort of ground themselves in the fact that they, they have survived. Uh, that, that's, that, that's, that's very helpful. But um, for people who've, who, who've had really traumatic experiences of, uh, of uh, uh, being injured or being uh, not surviving themselves or, or others, um, uh, this, 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 this can affect them for a considerable amount of time. I think that, that what's very clear is that for people who, who have really survived a life-threatening experience, they do not get over it that, in the sense of that life goes on as if it never happened. Um, it's part of their history um, and um, it, it, it has to be incorporated uh, into their own sort of life story uh, as something that, uh, that they experienced uh, there. So the notion of getting over it is, is not a helpful one. Thank you, Jim. Um, next question is from um, John Carr and he says, uh, do you have any thoughts about the number of calls to action in an emergency warning? Let me think about that, that uh, uh, for, for a moment. I th it, 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 mm. The, yeah. Okay. Um, the, I'm, I'm just trying, trying to think of the uh, of the, the relevant research uh, um, uh, there. Um, the the 
the evidence and most of the of the research evidence about that I'm aware of actually comes from the, from uh, the United States and uh, hurricane wa warnings, um, which is not quite the same as bushfires because hurricanes typically have a, a known track uh, and, um, and and they develop over, over a longer uh, period of time. Um, uh, but the evidence from that work seems to suggest that um, there, there needs to be frequent um, uh, uh, short messages, um, but they, they need to, to change with time. Simply repeating um, the same message with, with no new information uh, about it uh, tends to reduce um, uh, uh, the, the attention that people pay to it. So uh, my uh, folk like Barbara are much better uh, on this than me. Um, I think we, we, we need, the, the, the ideal is in uh, as frequent a call to action um, as to take into account changes in the situation. If that makes, I'm not sure I made myself clear there, but that, 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 that repeating myself, um, the evidence seems to be that just repeating exactly the same message uh, has a, a sort of a desensitizing effect. Um, uh, but frequent messages, which are, are, are updates, uh, is probably the ideal. So, is there anything um, that, that says uh, saying leave now? remember to turn the power off and uh, you know check you've got enough petrol in your car those three things that's fine but if it's leave now turn the power off check the petrol take your pets check on your grandmother and and do something else that's a few too many for yes, one warning uh, I, I think message. i think the, the, i think the the, the well it, I, the, 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 the 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 nature and purpose of a message is of course quite time, time dependent um, the, 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 the content of, uh, uh, of, say, an early warning message um, uh, where the threat is not imminent, uh, under a situation like that, uh, you can uh, put more things in, as it were. But uh, as the impact of the, of the threat event uh, uh, gets closer and closer, um, stress levels uh, among our householders are going to be increasing and um, I didn't go into the technical details but one of the one of the what what happens with anxiety is that the capacity of our working memory um, drops dramatically in other words uh, as we get anxious we are able to keep less and less in mind um, there um, that, that's one of the uh, the reasons uh, why checklists uh, are so in, uh, are so uh, useful. Um, uh, uh, a long time ago, when I was first introduced to, to, to these these sorts of ideas, uh, it was put to me that uh, in the old days um, uh, of of, air, of, uh, of aircraft, um, uh, 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 one of the, one of the first uh, demonstrably useful checklists. Um, it was for engine fire, this, the, the, this before jets uh, with internal combustion you know, engines, uh, and engine fires were quite frequent. And um, uh, um, the first checklist uh, had three things uh, on it um, in, in order because uh, pilots in, in an engine fire situation often got things wrong order. The, the checklist uh, um, uh, said switch off petrol switch on extinguisher, switch off power. Um, uh, because pilots uh, for, you know, in, in, in the emergency situation um, did it in the wrong order. Uh, no point in putting a, a fire extinguisher on if the petrol is still flowing. Um, don't switch off power because then you have no control uh, to switch on to, to the, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the extinguisher. Um, so just three things. <laughs> But, but those three things were uh, getting them get, getting them in the right order uh, was a problem uh, under high anxiety. Um, our, our working memory capacity uh, just drops dramatically. So, no, sorry, I'm repeating. No, thank you. Uh, yeah. We can't keep very much in mind when we get anxious. Right. 
thank you. So um, this is this is uh, something of a comment rather than a question, but it comes from Ian Mannix, um, oh. formerly of ABC, yeah. uh, and and coming in from Myanmar today. Um, he says, Jim, good presentation, thanks. You suggest brevity, but to effectively change a person's behaviour, they need validation, localization, personalization, understanding, and belief. So the idea of brevity is somewhat erroneous, isn't it? Uh, I take uh, Ian, Ian's uh, point, and he's a person of great experience and, 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 and knowledge, especially in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the, the, the warning area. Um, I didn't contextualise uh, well uh, my answer. Um, the brevity bit uh, is, is in, the, in, in the heat of the moment stuff. Uh, uh, when when uh, uh, the, the time available to make uh, life-saving decisions uh, is, is, is minimal. Um, uh, what I'm getting at is for, for people who, who, who are about to be impacted uh, by a fire event, um, the information uh, that, they, that they will be able to, to sort of apprehend and take in is very limited. So it, uh, it, should only, it, it needs to be only those things uh, which are most relevant uh, to, to that dire situation. Um, and certainly what Ian is getting at is, is the, the early warning stage uh, and the pre-event uh, uh, stage of, of education and instruction, certainly uh, all the, uh, the things that he's, he, he's listed there are terribly important, particularly the, the localization uh, and the personalization. If I just make, make a comment, um, one of the um, uh, first things that came from uh, the bushfire CRCs um, uh, a task force uh, for, with, uh, with the 2013 uh, fires in New South Wales um, was the change uh, in how fires are identified um, uh, with black, at Black Saturday and for some time after, a fire was identified by its starting point. Um, and uh, what we found uh, was that with uh, serious fast moving fires, which travelled a long way uh, quite quickly, um, the standard radio messages uh, which referred to the fire by its starting point name were often just ignored uh, by people sort of uh, a long way away. Um, uh, so uh, one of the, the first changes made was to alter that to the fire which started at is now there. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I understand from uh, New South Wales Rural Fire Service, who were among the first to make that, that, that change, that uh, uh, that has improved things. So this is the notion of, of, of relevance. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I think that it, uh, it's a good example uh, of how, uh, what makes sense to, uh, to operational folk, uh, the name of the fire, um, uh, then, uh, is, is not not helpful uh, to, to to householders. Yep, thank you. And I just note while I was looking for the next question, um, Ian has has made the time to type type a comment while he's been listening, and he says, "Thanks for your answer. We really need to explore further your statement that early warnings, which I that's Ian call education warnings, are the way to change people's behaviour. I'd all, urge all emergency agency warning disseminators to examine how to do that." So, I think mm. there's a yeah, there's a, there's a further discussion to be had on that. So look, I'm mindful of the time. Um, we've, we've got at least five minutes left before we're scheduled to come to an end. And I dare say some of our attendees at least will have to go and do something else. Um, question from Sean Gibbons. And Sean asks, would you have any comment about people who need to leave with animals or not wanting to leave with animals? Is the stress heightened? Oh, in, in, indeed. This, this fortunately, in, in, in some respects, there's been quite a bit of research uh, uh, conducted um, uh, recently about uh, issues of, of evacuation. Um, uh, th there, there were certain instances in the Canberra fires and also Black Saturday of people perishing uh, because uh, they were endeavouring to, uh, to, to to rescue animals. So it's a very serious uh, serious issue. Um, the only thing I can sensibly say 
uh, is, is what well, I stressed beforehand, the notion of a plan, uh, thinking through what if, uh, and that's even more uh, important uh, if there are um, uh, uh, family members with special needs, uh, elderly, uh, disabled, and, and even more so with animals. Um, if, if, if you, if, a really important uh, focus for, for the community bushfire safety education and in fact for, for, for hazard education of all kinds uh, is, is is dealing with or encouraging and assisting uh, households to, to, to plan and prepare uh, for, for the care of their animals uh, uh, in the event of, um, uh, of a threat. Um, preparation is, is everything. Uh, I mean, starting with um, how, you, how are you going to transport them, uh, then through to where are you going to take them, uh, what arrangements have to, to be made uh, uh, there. Uh, in the 2013 New South Wales uh, fires, um, uh, particularly the, uh, I forgot the name of the fire, but it, it was in the Yass uh, area, um, um, uh, local pony clubs uh, had previously, as I understand, um, made arrangements with pony cl clubs uh, in Canberra uh, that in the event of a fire, um, there were there were locations uh, where where horses in particular uh, could be taken, and uh, this worked extremely well. Uh, but this, this, the, the arrangements had been made prior, um, not to, sort of on the telephone as the flames are coming over the hill, kind of thing. Exactly. Um... Look, thank you. And another question here, this one's from Barb Ryan. Is there research from the military on the actions of stressed civilians? Um, yes, uh, th there's a lot of research um, that was done uh, in North America in the 50s and, and 60s by what was then the Disaster Research Center. So there's quite a, quite a, 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 a lot of mater material um, there. Uh, um, uh, and one of one of the the uh, findings that was um, stressed, <laughs> as it emphasised, um, uh, following all that research, was that uh, instances of of uh, sort of mob panic and um, uh, sort of uh, 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 violence and uh, looting uh, was very rare. Uh, it, it's, it, it's frequently been a, uh, a topic of uh, concern by uh, politicians and uh, uh, folk, but uh, the research uh, coming out, out, out of that, that essentially military, uh, military research, mil militarily sponsored research with civilians um, was um, uh, that the, you know, sort of panic was rare and that there was a great deal of pro-social behaviour um, that uh, informal uh, sort of organisations among neighbours and community groups quickly emerged um, uh, and this sort of local emerging uh, initiative was very, very important um, in terms of saving lives and minimising uh, minimizing, uh, damage. Um, uh, several years ago in um, uh, uh, oh, uh, many it was at the start of the Obama administration. A new director of the American uh, Federal Emergency uh, uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Authority, um, was appointed, and uh, uh, one of his sort of um, principles was that uh, in a mass disaster uh, event, the first responder, your first responder, uh, will be your neighbour, uh, as it were. Um, and um, that came out, of, again, that notion came out of the finding that um, in the disaster situations, um, people generally you know, took care of each other. And Barb's just uh, thanked you for that. So um, she's uh, just commented, thanks, Jim. Good lead. So look, those are all the questions that have been submitted, Jim, um, and I think we're going to finish just about on time. So unless anybody is going to put their hand up and type something really quickly, I think we're going to call it a wrap there. Um, I hope uh, to everybody out there that you've enjoyed the webinar this morning. We're going to be announcing further webinars from uh, EMPA soon, so please watch your mailboxes. Just before you start logging off, um, 
I would like to uh, give a shout out to the high profile events team who have been uh, wrangling things behind the scenes for us. Um, they will be sending you a short survey when you leave the webinar. We really would value their, uh, your feedback. Um, thanks to COVID, we have gone online with some of our offerings a lot more quickly than we might have uh, we might have done previously. Um, we can, uh, you know, we can always take it forward from here. So, thank you again for uh, taking part, Jim. Thank you very much for your time and your insights. And um, I think the way this works is that we just leave. So, thank you. <laughs>